Hi, I'm Scott Brady with Overland Journal, and we are out here in the Grand Staircase Escalante of Utah, and we are trying to get to the most remote point in the lower 48 states. And it's about 30 and a half miles from the nearest incorporated city if you were to take a big circle around that range. And that means that you're about uh, 70 miles from point to point. So it's just the kind of thing that we love to do when we take these trucks out into the desert. So it's not only a beautiful place, but it's also a lonely place. So it's something where you can get away from civilization, you can get away from other people, and you can come out and kind of soak up this beauty that we have around us. So this is a beautiful place. It's something that, uh, a place that I'm constantly drawn to, and uh, the night, uh, night sky is brilliant with stars, and we got a little bit of rain even in the early morning, and then it settled down the dust, and the big clouds spread away, and now we've got this beautiful blue sky, and and a little bit of clouds here and there just to make the photographs better. But overall for me, uh, this is what we do. This is why we love what we do, is to come to places like this with, with great and interesting people and uh, take those photographs and share those stories with our readers. Hi, I'm Bruce Storn. Uh, I live in Prescott, Arizona, and I'm the owner of IDC Photo Video, and I'm a Canon Explorer of Light. Boy, the, the, the U.S. Southwest is just generally incredible, but Utah probably has some of the most uh, iconic landscapes that you'd ever want to see. From the slot canyons down near Page, Arizona, up to the uh, various national parks in the middle of the state, uh, you, you really can't go wrong. But what I think uh, uh, Utah offers me is just uh, un unbelievable vistas and uh, uh, clarity, uh, a clean quality that just uh, Feels like there's never been anybody else uh, walking through the place, but no matter what, we're already off to a good start and gonna have a great time. I'm Cam Brensinger. I live in Arlington, Massachusetts, and I'm the founder and president of Nemo Equipment Incorporated. Well, we're, you know, we think of ourselves as kind of a solutions company. We're really about outdoor experiences and trying to design and engineer solutions that improve those experiences. So we make a range of equipment for, um, you know, from backpacking to Arctic exploration, uh, mountaineering, uh, adventure racing, and overland. And in each case, you know, we try to use our experience and the experience of our consumers um, to, to create uh, clever solutions um, to improve the experiences outdoors. So we spent some time this morning with Cam Brenzinger from Nemo Equipment and uh, Cam is uh, an incredible engineer and he's created some of the most impressive and durable products in the outdoor industry. Well, we because he's a, quite the rock climber, ice climber for many years. Uh, I think he's been doing this for over two decades and has become quite proficient at, us, at it. He spent some time with us uh, showing us rappelling and ascending today and we're gonna need that when we get to the loneliest place tomorrow. So the morning was a relaxing one, a fun one, we got a chance to rappel off uh, about 30 feet and ascend back up the same distance. All the team members got to do that. Some people rappelling for the first time in their life, uh, and that was really fun to watch. Uh, my name is Elsie McLaren, and um, I'm from Prescott, Arizona, and I work as an executive assistant for Overland Journal. Yeah, so first, my first rappel ever, any kind of rock climbing actually, I've never done anything like that. It was really, I was a little bit scared at first. Looking down the cliff is pretty intimidating. Once you're all hooked up and you, you feel pretty secure, I was actually surprised at how secure I felt. Yeah, it was, it was easy going down. It was a little bit harder coming up. <laughs> that was good and it also, it was secured to a truck, <laughs> which uh, was nice. And I did watch several other people go down, so it wasn't too, too scary that way. Uh, my name is Ray Highland. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Overland Journal. It's a beautiful place to, to learn this, but at the same time, it's uh, the consequences are a little bigger than they are if you're slipping off a wall in a gym. So getting all hooked up with uh, Cam's advice and learning how the machines work and the, the different tools and the ropes and going through the safety aspect of it was, was really valuable. Cam took us through all of the, the safety aspects of the, the tools he was using showed us how it all worked, showed us why we could feel secure, and uh, everybody who, who did the rappel this morning and did the ascension later uh, 
felt really confident, I think. Felt really uh, secure and uh, comfortable in Cam's hands. Well, we, we practiced some basic um, high angle systems. So we set up, at first we set up a, a, a rappel um, using a stout tree and, and our vehicle and, uh, and equalized that to, to a static line, which we dropped over a cliff that's right behind me here. And we, and we practiced uh, repelling off that. Um, afterwards, we, we used a caving style ascension system uh, to climb rope. And, uh, and later on, a few of us tried a, a top rope uh, method for belaying so that we could, uh, we could try climbing it. And basically, all of those um, techniques we're practicing um, in the likelihood that we're going to need them tomorrow when we try to get to this lonely spot. Well, boy, one of the best things about this trip is getting to get behind the wheel of the uh, uh, American Expedition Vehicles uh, Wrangler with a Hemi. Yes, it does have a Hemi, and uh, there is no substitute for horsepower. And uh, uh, torque, I guess, was really what uh, I was most impressed with out here. Uh, the, the Wrangler I'm driving is a four-door, and it's a you know stout vehicle, a uh, fair amount of weight. But boy, with that uh, six-speed and the Hemi, you can just idle it down and torque through anything. It's a, it's a real peach. I hope to uh, uh, steal it sometime before the expedition is over and, and blame it on uh, summer. It's got the truck I'm driving. Um, we fondly refer to as Ubercon. Um, you know, it was an attempt at kind of making the ultimate um, Jeep platform-based overland vehicle. It's a partnership between AT Overland, American Expedition Vehicles, and NEMO. So NEMO has designed a tent for the top in conjunction with AT Overland. And American Expedition, uh, Expedition Vehicles has done a full fit out um, of the drivetrain and bumpers and wheels uh, and the Hemi conversion. And it's, it's really a remarkable thing. Fundamentally, the Jeep is a great truck. And uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to set up an Overlander and of course, um, you know, everything is, uh, you know, there's, there's many right solutions, but it's, it's really a remarkable truck. So driving the Action Camper yesterday was really interesting. It's, uh, when you, you look at the vehicle, you imagine it is going to be like driving a Winnebago through the wilderness. It looks massive. And yet when you get inside it, it's just like driving another JK. So it still has the, the full capabilities of that Jeep. And uh, on the highway, you, you can still pass normal cars, you can still keep up with traffic. You get onto the trail and uh, technical areas where you need to climb over a rock, or you need to manage your speed, you need to preload the front or back suspension according to what you're covering. It lets you do all of that, which is amazing given the comfort level inside that vehicle. After coming in from the north on the Hole in the Rock Road, we headed off towards 52 Mile Bench, which is where we set up our camp for the night. We knew we needed to get started early in the morning because we had found a weakness in that very prominent wall. And this wall does run for 52 miles. We had spent some time with some seven and a half minute topo maps and we had found an old pack trail that was indicated that coincided with the weakness that we could see from camp. So we started off really early and we made a pretty good approach towards the wall. It was actually quite a bit of effort and distance just to get to the base of the wall that we needed to climb. It took us uh, several hours to get there because the, there was no main trail, there was a lot of irregularity in the terrain, there was some pretty significant washouts and washes that we needed, needed to navigate, and the terrain itself just meant for slow going. This wasn't a hardened trail, and it took us some time to get up to the, to the base of the cliff. But fortunately, once we reached the base of the cliff, we did find the remains of that very old pack trail, and we were able to start to use it to ascend up the surface. Now, it, from the appearance of it, it looked as if we were still gonna have to do a climb at the very top that would require some roping. However, once we got there, we could see that the weakness actually occurred behind a wall that stuck out just slightly in front of the main wall surface. And this gave us a very small crack that we could navigate up and through using this old pack trail. So it turned out that the pack trail assumption was correct and we used that to get to the top of 52 mile bench. Adventure is, uh, it's my drug. I mean, uh, you, you get a hit of adrenaline every now and then and it allows you to get through the tedious times in life. Um, I think if, if you don't face a little uh, adventure, a little danger, a little opportunity to learn more about yourself uh, every year than 
then you uh, just get older and older. Uh, I think one of the best things you can do to remain young is to uh, be the first guy to step up to back off the cliff, uh, be the first guy to uh, try something that you haven't tried before. So um, adventure, yeah, you can't beat it. It's, uh, it's addictive, it is uh, healthy, it's, it's uh, really great for the soul. I think today is a great example of what adventure is to me of um, doing stuff that, that scares you a little bit. <laughs> so we just made it to the top of 52 mile bench. So it's a huge feature here uh, in the Grand Staircase Escalante. And there's this one particular spot that has a crack in the head wall that allowed us to get up. Basically a, a rock scramble to the top. No fixed ropes were required didn't have to do any climbing, but uh, we don't know what's ahead of us. This is now uncharted territory. This is the end of the pack trail, and now we're uh, heading off through the brush again. By this point, it was already starting to get late in the day. In fact, it was getting very close to our point of no return or our turnaround point that we had decided on earlier on in the day. And the main reason for that was the amount of time it took us just to get to the top of 52 mile bench. But we did recognize that we were getting very close at this point. So we had to make a decision as a group. As a team, we needed to decide, do we all turn around at this point or do we let some of the stronger climbers and hikers proceed ahead and try and get to the most remote point? Obviously, this is always a challenge anytime that you're in a group because everybody in the group is gonna have a slightly different opinion. But fortunately, Cam Brenzinger, who was the strongest climber and hiker in the group, felt very confident that Ray and him could make it to this most remote point and back in a safe fashion. We also had two meter radios with us and we had lots and lots of equipment to survive the night. So we decided at this point that we were gonna break the group up and have four of us stay behind and then have Cam and Ray proceed ahead to the most remote point. To me personally, adventure is about discovering what my limits are and then discovering how I can overcome them. So, for example, I've always been a little bit nervous uh, with heights and precipices, and today's uh, opportunity to do some rappelling and do some climbing, working with somebody like Cam from Nemo, who is, is a, a world-class climber, uh, was fantastic for me because it allowed me to really feel I was pushing myself to those limits, getting to the point where Normally I, I would not have been able to go any further and having people on hand who could show me how to push past that point and experience something which was incredible and wonderful. We just invented a new sport because that would be a classic canyoneering canyon if we were going down, but instead we're going up. So we just had to uh, stem our way up a little chimney, which was pretty cool. It looked just like a, like a uh, amusement park water slide couple of sketchy anchors on half dead trees, all in a day's work. Adventure to me means taking the uncertain path. Um, I think, you know, too much of our lives these days uh, are kind of predictable. And I think when you choose the uncertain path, um, it really forces you to improvise. Um, it makes you rely on the people that you're with. It really promotes camaraderie. Um, and it sharpens your senses. I think when you're when you're on a path not knowing where it leads or what the dangers might be, uh, it really makes you pay attention. And I think all of that is good for the soul. You can see why it's so lonely. <laughs> oh, sliding. It's very confused. GPS is not confused. Oh, shoot. Oh. Uh. Dad. <sighs> it wants us to go back. Let's just climb back up the rock. You can lose satellites in the hole in the cave. Yeah. Getting colder. I think it's here. It's this rock right in front of us. Because it was a foot this way when we were standing right at that point right up there. And it's saying a foot this way, so it's right here. Right on, I'm Cam Brensinger, here with uh, a great crew of folks from Overland Journal after a long day 
Ray and I have just made it to the loneliest place in the lower 48. And uh, now we're about to hike back out to join the rest of the team at the side of the canyon and uh, hustle back to our Jeeps. We had originally decided to meet at this waypoint where there was a small cave and outcropping. What had happened was Austin, Kelsey, Bruce and I went down to that point. We found that the cave was just simply too small to maintain the group through the night. We had found a much larger cave that would provide sufficient protection from weather, but also allow us a little bit more room to spread out should we have to sleep in there over the evening. That did create a small problem because we had originally communicated to Ray and to Cam that that was where we were gonna meet up. So what we did is we put together a small little note, left it in the cave. Once they got up to the main cave, which we had a nice fire going, we had a tarp spread out for everybody to be able to sleep on, we decided it was still early enough in the evening that we could get out all together and not have to spend the night out in the cold. Everybody in the group seemed to be game for that. Let's proceed and move on, which is what we did. So we went back down into the basin, climbed back out to the other side, and next thing you know, we were on the top of 52 mile bench again. Then we had to navigate that very narrow pack trail that dropped off the edge of the cliff in the middle of the night. We were already getting a little physically exhausted from the length of the day, which means that every step was purposeful. Once we got to the bottom of 52 mile bench, we still had several miles to get back to the truck. And of course, this was at the end of a very long day, approaching 11 o'clock at night, almost midnight, and we used our GPS track to navigate back to the vehicles. We were very lucky to have that GPS track and the breadcrumbs from earlier in the day because that allowed us to negotiate those more prominent features that we would have to basically go straight through if we were using only a compass bearing. Once we got back to the truck, we all celebrated with a, a great meal and, and uh, drank a bunch of water and pretty much all crashed out immediately and ready for the next day. We just got back from our little adventure to reach the loneliest spot last night and it was amazing. Um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to be getting into when I when we went on this trip. Uh, personally, I pushed a lot of my boundaries, my personal boundaries. We were rock climbing, we were rappelling, um, we were even rappelling at night into darkness, like hanging into space. It was crazy, it was fun, it was exciting, and it was scary all at the same time. Um, you know, having these experiences with good friends, and we were just in such a beautiful spot there in southern Utah. Um, just that whole package is what made it an adventure for me, truly an adventure. And you know, while we reached the loneliest spot in the lower 48, which was, which was really interesting to do, with good friends and, and uh, just you know, exciting places to go and beautiful backdrops like this, we, we could have had an adventure anywhere. What a great, what a great trip. Um, yesterday was a real challenge. We, uh, we spent about 15 hours on the trail together, um, climbing and hiking and rappelling and, uh, and dealt with some snow and rain and a lot of wind along the way. And uh, I think it was just, it was a great affirmation of how I feel about adventure. Um, you know, we, uh, we faced the unknown together and we had to solve a lot of problems along the way and, uh, and kind of brush up against our own boundaries. And you know, we left, I think, with a great appreciation for each other and, uh, and for the beautiful landscape we were in. Um, it was a real success. Um, it, was a, it made it feel really adventurous going someplace that I've never been before, someplace that's um, so far away from anything. It's very remote, <laughs> obviously, the most remote point. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that made it feel very adventurous being somewhere where not very many people have been before. I think one of my favorite things was hiking back down the mountain late at night because it it was a little bit more intense than <laughs> hiking in the daytime. And so everyone needed, you know, to stay together and it was really awesome. One of my favorite favorite things was um, when you would turn off your headlamp and standing on top of a cliff you feel like there's nothing nothing below you and nothing above you but this amazing sky and that was pretty cool. In the start of this adventure we asked each other what adventure meant to us and when I look back on what we achieved it was much less to do with the fact that we actually got to the most remote point in the 48 states. It was the fact that we all became 
better travelers and better adventurers and better friends because of it. When I think about the people that were along and I think about Cam and the professional way in which he, he does his thing, the way he traveled with us and the way that he led our group to that place, his decision making, his, his knowledge and mastery of the equipment, all of those things really inspire confidence in a group of people. And I think that that's what we all need to work towards. We all need to work towards being better, being more proficient at the things that we do. That way when we're in the middle of nowhere in Mongolia or Tajikistan, that those skill sets are available to us to solve problems. And it was also very inspiring to travel with Bruce. Uh, Bruce Dorn is an incredible photographer. Um, he's become a good friend. He's a master of his art. And it's amazing to see that uh, mastery of art um, elevate to that level of professionalism. And to get to maybe soak a little bit of that up for myself as, a, as an aspiring master photographer. And of course, we had great support from Kelsey and from Austin and from Ray on the trip. And everybody was pulling on the same rope. And I guess for me as an expedition leader, that's the greatest reward. It's not just achieving the goal, it's doing it with a group of people that you really trust and enjoy traveling with. And for me, those are the things that I remember. Those are the memories. It has much less to do with the fact that we got to a certain geographic position and more the fact that we had fun doing it and we overcame challenges and we learned more about ourselves and each other and the equipment that we were using. And I think ultimately, when I think of overland travel, that's the reward, right? That's getting to these places, seeing the remote things, traveling with unique equipment and unique people and learning a little bit more about ourselves along the way. So it was actually pretty funny after the the advanced crew went all the way to the most remote point we huddled down in this little cave with a fire and um, we were trying to get in communications with the other guys and we, we couldn't get them on the radio they were off channel and we tried flashing lights and everything else and then Kelsey hasn't been saying anything all night <laughs> and, then, and then she says oh I have an idea We'll just have Scott fall to sleep, and then when he starts snoring, then they'll know exactly where to go. <laughs> and then that prompted us to uh, to do group snoring and sleeping sessions. So I think it went something like me 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 me. And we did find them. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. I don't care how many spares Scott thinks we need. We did not need to take the engine to the top of the mountain. And I wasn't born yesterday. This is not a Hemi. This is a small block Chevy and there's no freaking way that we needed that at the loneliest place in the lower 48.